Did you ever have one of those series that kind of sneaks up on you over the years? Not like trying out a game for the first time way after everybody else has played it and then finally seeing what they were talking about, but rather when you kind of realise you've been a fan of something for way longer than you initially thought. Yeah, for me, one of those is definitely Rayman, because when thinking of a series of games to talk about on this channel, the limbless French thingamajig never really sprung to mind until recently, when I realised just how many of those games I've played over the years. I've pretty much ended up with most of the main entries in this series, along with some of the various ports and spin-offs, and it's never really registered with me that, yeah, I guess I am a long-term fan of Rayman. But with each game in the series only being played through maybe once and spread out over a number of years, I guess I just kind of forgot about that. And, you know, what's a little YouTube channel hobby like this good for if it ain't for rediscovering some of those memories now I'm older and speaking a bunch about them to anybody who'll listen. So, yeah, the original Rayman is where I'll be kicking things off. Now, it kind of goes without saying at this point that I do prefer my platformer games to be in 3D, at least when it comes to ideas for videos on this channel. And while Rayman did get to that, I feel like I'd be doing the entire series a massive injustice if I didn't look at where it all began. Just like everybody else, you've got to be able to walk before you can run. Well, there's all of that, plus I'm pretty sure it's been about 15 years or so since I actually sat down and attempted to finish this game, which I'm certain I wasn't able to do as a kid, so yeah, let's pop it in and see what happens. First things first, it wouldn't be a discussion about the original Rayman without mentioning just how many versions of this one game are out there. What started out as being a thing made for the Super Nintendo got shifted to other systems like the Atari Jaguar first and foremost, and then onto PC and PlayStation, before then being released on pretty much every device known to man. But I'll be sticking with the PlayStation version for the time being though, as that's the one I have, and there's some benefits to that that I'll bring up later on. First impressions are really good though. Full motion videos from this sort of time could occasionally have a bit of a weird look to them. You know, like you could tell it was very early days for 3D animation at the time, so some of them would unintentionally look like those ones you get at bowling alleys whenever you get a strike or a spare. But using that technology for something 2D like this holds up extremely well. Well, you know, outside of the image resolution, but what are you gonna do? This was the original PlayStation after all. This introduction though, I swear, even after all this time, I remember most of the words to it. It's animated really well and it does a great job of just setting up the reason for why we're about to do what we're about to do. So the world is at peace and the big plot device thing is happily sat in its place, keeping everybody merry, happy and jolly. That is, until Mr. Dark appears and steals it and then fights his way to the other side of the world and generally makes a big mess. Look at him, this guy looks so cool. He's basically just a cloak and a hat with a big pair of googly eyes, but he just looks so cool. You get this really nice shot of him watching over everything he's done at the end too. It's pretty menacing, but I like him. And then we have Rayman, who's just like, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll save the day then. Go for it, whatever. It's a simple introduction, but with great execution, I feel. You know, the way certain lines are accompanied by fitting pieces of music, and the almost, but not quite cheesy line delivery from the magician character, and the way everything just kind of flows together. It's really nice and fairly memorable, I think. I mean, I basically remember the entire intro word for word, well over 15 years after I first played it, so yeah, that's gotta mean something. Once you do get into the menus and the game itself, there's no denying that the original Rayman has a style all of its own, even when compared to the other games in the series. The vibrant colours, the detailed sprite work, and the whimsical cast of limbless characters and creatures. There's still nothing quite like this game in the way it looks, and the same can be said for its diverse selection of level themes. And yeah, at face value we have a few simple themes like a forest and a mountainous region, but then you'll eventually move on to areas themed around musical notes and instruments. Art and crafts levels filled with pencils, paints and paintbrushes, vast cave networks and a place made entirely of candy and chocolate. And yeah, with these themes combined, all reflected on the map screen, it's just... I, I don't really know what else to say, it's just a distinctly Rayman 1 kind of thing it has going on. You're not gonna get this particular set of themes with these kind of visuals anywhere else, that's for damn sure. 
One really nice detail about the level select screen that I've always liked is that it's also framed by Mr. Dark's binoculars from the opening sequence as well. There's just so much detail packed into this game and we've barely started. Above all else though, I love Rayman's design. Nothing else around the time was even remotely similar to him in terms of his looks. And other than a few smaller cosmetic changes, he has kept this iconic limbless look throughout the years. It all came down to technical limitations at the time too, as Rayman was going to have arms and legs at one point, but like I say, the original prototype of this game was going to be a thing on the Super Nintendo, so to save graphical memory, they simply deleted those parts of his body, and man, what a great move that ended up being. Thank you, Super Nintendo. As well as visually standing out from the rest of the platformer mascot character crowd, this design really lends itself well to some abilities that only someone with separate body parts like this could actually do, but I'm getting a bit excited and ahead of myself, so I'll talk about all of those later on. So, seeing as we're here in the levels good and proper now, let's talk about Rayman's moveset and how... Uh, devoid of anything it is for a good chunk of the game. What you're seeing here with the walking left and right and jumping, that's pretty much all you can do for a while, and controlling him in general feels really stiff at first. I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, as it'll sound stupid if I say his movement feels like a digital switch either being on or off with no middle ground, when it is literally that because of the D-pad controls, but I think it's the lack of a running command at the start of the game that really does it for me. I'm so used to being able to move around a little bit faster than this from the get-go in these kind of games, and no matter how many times I go back and play Rayman, it always throws me off not being able to go any faster than this to start off with. It doesn't take too long to get used to though, and you're soon given some more basic moves like being able to hang from ledges and even attack using Rayman's fist, but it does still seem weird to me that unlocking such basic things like this is something you have to do in the first place. The ledge grab is another one of these for me. While it doesn't take that long to actually unlock it, the fact you do have to unlock it just seems kind of strange to me and it really doesn't help that some of the times you really need this move to engage, like during a boss encounter, Rayman just sometimes decides not to grab the ledge anyway. Throwing Rayman's fist though, this is really cool and it's exactly what I was getting at about being something only Rayman could really do because of his non-existent arms and legs. Once you unlock this thing, you can tap the square button for a quick throw that'll hit things that are pretty much right next to you, or you can hold down that button to charge it up and launch it further across the screen. Combine that with a few power-ups that make the fist hit harder and move faster and being able to use it in conjunction with another ability and yeah, you've got a pretty great little attack that's useful and full of personality too. It's just another one of those distinctly Rayman things at this point, and it's all thanks to them deleting some pixels earlier on in his life cycle. Overall, Rayman's moveset is pretty good though, but the pace that you do unlock these moves is a little hit and miss, at least for me. Like I said at the start of the video, you've got to be able to walk before you can run, and Rayman takes that literally, because by the time you're able to move any quicker than his default walking speed, you're already well into the second half of the game, which is just Bizarre. I mean, could you imagine booting up the original Donkey Kong Country and not being able to run until you get to the snow levels? Because that's basically what Rayman does. And yeah, I know, most of the levels prior to you unlocking the running ability have the levels laid out in a way that you don't really need it, but it's still pretty odd to me, even after all this time. At one point, you're even doing a chase sequence, and it happens before you get the option to run, and it's the strangest feeling. Having a game make you want to run as fast as you can, but this is all you can do. I mean, in my brain, I just think of it as trying to do a boulder dash level in Crash Bandicoot 2, but only using Crash's walking animation. So yeah, I guess having this running ability unlock much earlier on would have solved my issue personally. Maybe have the ledge grab from the very beginning of the game, and then unlock the ability to run when you would have unlocked that. Problem solved. At least in my head. I know that's probably not going to sit well with everyone, but what are you going to do? It's not all like that though. Some of the moves you do unlock feel like a nice addition to what you can already do, so I'm a pretty big fan of being able to swing around on the floating rings. To use these, you'll jump towards them and shoot Rayman's fist at them to grab on, and then he'll swing from side to side, where you can jump off and even latch onto another one if needed. I really do like how Rayman's fist will connect to the ring either on the way towards it, or if you overshoot and it hits on the way back, then you'll still get the same result. It makes you feel like you have a little bit more of a window to actually grab onto these things, even if it's completely by accident. When jumping off of these things though, eh, I don't know, sometimes I feel like Rayman's jump is nerfed if you do it at the wrong moment, but this didn't happen too often and you do get a feel 
for it after a while. You basically have to jump off of the ring just before you would usually think you'd have to. Don't do it at the peak of the swing, do it just before and you'll keep some of that momentum. There are some other sort of temporary moves you do get, like these fairy guys that appear in certain levels to shrink down Rayman so you can go into gaps, or you can use these giant plums to stand on them and get across water or spikes, and maybe my favourite one being this magic seed that you can use to grow flowers that Rayman can jump on to help you go higher and higher up on into the level. But the thing is with all of these is that they're all really underused. My favourite one for instance, it shows up once in the first world for one level. In fact it's not even an entire level, it's just one screen of a level, and then never again throughout the entire game. It's a bit of a shame really, especially after unlocking all of those other moves, because we could have had a more frantic version of this appear later on in the game after we get used to how everything works, but no, that doesn't happen. And I get that some games do this, you know, they introduce a new idea and then ditch it quickly, but that's usually when it's some sort of sidetracked gameplay that you wouldn't necessarily want the entire game to be about. Which, you know, Rayman does do this as well, not everything is going to be something you want to do all the time, but then you'll get ideas with this that have some real potential for extra platforming, but then they never show up ever again, and it's like, why? That was a pretty good idea. I don't get it. Anyway, the last majorly important move you'll unlock has to be the helicopter hair. This thing is almost as iconic as Rayman's design and his throwable fist, as it's been something he's been able to consistently do over the years, and yeah, it acts as a little glide move. In some levels, you are given this magic potion that lets you freely fly around through these mazes of sharp spikes and rocks, which give me some major Donkey Kong Country 2 vibes, but overall it does act pretty similarly to how Insomniac Games would eventually implement this kind of thing in Spyro the Dragon. You know, you can do the move whenever you want to go downwards, but in select levels you could actually fly around. Except it's more like Donkey Kong Country 2 than it is Spyro, but you know, it kind of reminds me of that. These levels are fine enough though, not great enough to be a big part of the overall game, but that's exactly how it ended up, with this just being a thing you do a couple of times here and there. You press the jump button to go a little higher, then you let go to go a little bit lower. I'm pretty sure I could use a certain monkey game again for a comparison there, but yeah. It just works fine. I do really like the detail of using Rayman's helicopter hair to slice through ropes at certain points though. I couldn't remember this part of the game from when I played it years ago, so I didn't really know what to do until the sound effect gave it away, and it was like, oh wow, that's actually pretty cool. Once you do start to flesh out Rayman's moveset though, he ends up feeling pretty agile, being able to chain jumps, swings, and glides all together with some later sequences feeling amazing if you do them correctly. After a few attempts mind, this game gets pretty brutal towards the end. And while it's not actually a move you do yourself, this is something that will happen a lot to you throughout your playthrough, which I'm not a big fan of, and that is the knockback animation. Each time Rayman takes a hit, he'll do this knee-jerk reaction to it. Well, you know, if he actually had knees, that is. And he'll fly backwards from the direction he was facing. This one boss fight in particular, he friggin' sends Rayman flying across the screen for some reason. What is going on here? Look at this. Most of the time, this is nothing more than that. It's just a slight knock back, but when the game does start to get a little bit more, uh, let's say, complicated, this can easily be the result of your death, which is a thing I've never been a fan of. And it's not just in Rayman either. I've generally always thought of the knockback animation as you being punished a second time in a situation where you wouldn't have fallen into a death pit for such a minor mistake, when simply taking off a hit point would have been punishment enough, you know? Again, Donkey Kong Country. You take a hit in that game and you'll lose a Kong, but the game will pause and keep you where you were to let you reorientate yourself for a second, but no, you don't get that here, you just get knocked back instead. I don't know, just not really a big fan of it to be honest. Starting out the adventure though, things are pretty mellow. I definitely remember this forest area of the game really well, and I really like how most of the stages look. Despite being a strictly 2D game, the entire screen in these areas are filled to the brim with detail in both the foreground and the background. As well as being a decent platforming level, it does feel like you are travelling through an actual location within this magical world that the game is set within, which is a feeling that gets completely thrown away at 
times. Honestly, what I'm about to say can only really be applied to Bandland and Picture City, as all of the other worlds are very much like the forest, looking and sounding like they're an actual place, whereas these two, I don't know. I always got the feeling the foregrounds of these worlds were as if somebody was just doing it on a Friday afternoon before they had to go home, so they just quickly copy and pasted a bunch of the platforms all over the place and called it a day. It's really bad for that in Bandland in particular, I'd say. You've got all of these musical notes and occasional enemies shaped like musical instruments, not to mention everything going on in the background, but outside of that in the foreground, there's just this random blue texture all over the place, which really makes it look like some of these individual stages were just slapped together in a drawing program. You know, you just get the thing and then you put it here, and blah, 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 blah. there you go, that, yep, that'll do, whatever. Yeah! This can vary depending on which version of the game you play, so for instance there's a level that looks like this at one point in one of the other versions, which is way more like it. That is the Bandland that I actually want to explore, not random blue platforms for no reason. What is this? I'm not going to go into the specifics of how each level's layout can be different in each subsequent version though, but one super noteworthy thing about the PS1 port is that soundtrack. Oh man, this aspect of the game alone is completely completely transformative. So like I said earlier, the game originally came out on the Atari Jaguar, where the music was, you know, it was fine enough for what it was on, I think. But this version has the benefit of being released a little bit later, and on a CD-based media format, which means we've got some amazing quality revisions of those original tracks, and they are just so good. got a really nice mix of high octane energetic music combined with some more atmospheric tracks sprinkled in which admittedly work better in some places than others but still the entire selection of music found throughout this PS1 port is absolutely fantastic. So much so that I am almost certain I've used some of these tracks in all of my recent videos on the run up to talking about Rayman so yeah it has definitely embedded itself in my mind as a great soundtrack over the years. Anyway so to go back to talking about the levels for a bit each one of these is mostly going to be about just getting from one end to the other. You'll have to avoid some enemies and occasionally use parts of the environment to help you out along the way, but for the most part you will just be going in a fairly straight line towards the exit sign where Rayman will do a bit of a jig and then move on to the next area. Each level as it is on the map is actually a selection of different scenes from within that world's general visual theme, and at the end of each set you'll encounter a boss fight. You know how it is, it's your usual platformer game stuff. Along Along the way, you're going to want to free the Electoons from their cages though, you know, those little guys from the opening cutscene that lose their natural stability and scatter all over the world! Troublesome, isn't it? And untidy too. Most of the time these will be along the path you'll be going through the levels anyway, at least in the first couple of worlds, but later on these get really difficult to find, especially in those levels that feel like they're just full of platforms that have been arbitrarily slapped all over the place with no rhyme or reason. What is this? What am I looking at here? And I get it, these kind of things do deserve to be hidden from time to time, which I'm not against, but I feel like in a game like this there needs to be some form of subtle indication of anything being hidden anywhere off screen. Not necessarily for every single cage, but at least some of them, surely. Because look at this, the entire damn screen feels like it's hiding something in some of these levels, and it makes finding a good chunk of these cages from the middle and ending parts of the game feel like a freaking wild goose chase. Where the hell am I supposed to go? Now this wouldn't be a huge problem if it was a secondary objective, or maybe even like a few other games where you can beat the game if you reach a certain threshold of cages in total, you know, in order to get the actual ending, but then you'd get something extra if you collect every single one. But with Rayman, you are going to hit a brick wall at one point when you realise that is not the case here. You do actually have to collect every single one of those cages to even see the ending portion of this journey, let alone how the game ends, which is crazy. 
And yeah, this is all leading up to what exactly prevented me from beating this game as a kid because, well, it's pretty common knowledge that Rayman is a fairly tough game. Almost as soon as you're done with the first world, things rapidly get harder, with Bandland essentially being the no man's land for the younger version of me. Pretty much everything beyond that point I only ever saw in screenshots from magazines or if I cheated my way to that part of the game or something. And while I'm not adverse to a challenge these days, yeah, I've gotta say, I really do feel like Rayman is still a bit too much at times and certain parts of it have not aged well at all. First of all, there's the lives system. I've said it before but I'll just go ahead and say it again. As I've grown older I really have kind of gone off the idea of these in general as you either end up with a game where the lives become completely irrelevant thanks to how easy they are to find or a game that seems like it is willingly wasting your time with game over screens and booting you back to the very start of the main menu just because you messed up a few times and yeah Rayman is one of those games. Dying just becomes way too much of a punishment or an inconvenience even towards the end of the game because it can just end up taking up a lot of your time. Time which for me as a working adult I don't have as much of these days so I don't like it being wasted on stuff like this. Not only is it easy to take damage which again on its own isn't necessarily a problem you know the game's got to get more difficult as it goes on after all but combine that with a hit point meter that gets completely reset to only three hits after you die irrespective of how many of those power-up things you've collected along the way along with any of the offensive power-ups like the fist strength and speed boosts being taken away from you it makes some of these levels even harder than they already were after you've died so you know if you get pretty far into a level and then reach a checkpoint for instance and then die well now you're gonna have to suddenly do the rest of the level without those items you would have otherwise had and yeah I can already picture it in my head you know the get good response would probably still apply here but I don't know there's just a few too many little things here that stack up on top of each other that get to me after a while the fact most if not all of the actual boss fights throughout this game are found at the end of their own already pretty difficult levels anyway means you can often be at a huge disadvantage with some of these guys before you even begin and weirdly some of these aren't even full-blown fights either there's this one here for instance where you're almost doing what would probably be considered a boss fight in any other situation but it's just kind of here and it happens and it's also one of those times Rayman just refused to grab onto the ledge here what are you doing man you're killing me here I really started to get impatient with this boss fight though the Viking pirate lady in picture city the boss fight itself isn't too bad but the various phases of it take forever to get through and the build-up to it takes way too long before the fight even begins you have to stand around and wait for the curtains to open and then you have to fight these guys and then you have to wait for her to appear in person and you have to do this each and every time you die and it's like Groundhog Day after a while. All of this but especially the bosses get even more stressful when you see this game has a limited amount of continues as well. So this is what happens if you die then you lose a life you know it's no big deal that's kind of how it is in every video game ever right if you lose all of your lives then you'll use up a continue where you'll start the current level from the very beginning but if you lose all of those continues then it's all the way back to the main menu losing all of your progress since the last save so you better damn well make sure you save after every single level like I did. I just really hate continue systems in home console games. They're basically a screen that does the equivalent of hard resetting your console. I get that continue screens were a thing in arcade games because they were a pay as you go kind of game. You know, you stick in another coin and then you can have another go rather than buying the entire arcade cabinet. But I've just hated how that carried over into some home console games. Why is this here? Of course I want to continue. Why would I not want to continue? Dying enough times to reach this point and then restarting the entire level from the beginning is punishment enough, especially when it's because of a mess up you made in the boss fight that's at the end of an already difficult level. But then to be shot out of a cannon straight back to the opening Ubisoft logo for doing that a few more times is just overkill. It's like a punishment for being punished one too many times. And I know this isn't going to be an issue for everybody, especially for those that like Rayman just the way it is, but unfortunately for them this is 
is not a new feeling for me. I've always felt this way, especially about the first Rayman, which is probably why I didn't get very far with it as a kid, but there you go. It is a product of its time though, so while I've never particularly liked this setup myself, it is just how these things go when going back to play some of these older platforming games. Thankfully, I don't even have to look very far for an alternative to this entire setup, because when the series did eventually return to 2D platforming, we got something a little more up my alley when it comes to how it handles lives. In Rayman Origins here, you just do one screen at a time, and while some of these do get pretty damn difficult, you can just try them as many times as you like with fairly quick respawns after each death. While the gameplay in Rayman Origins isn't always at breakneck speed, the way it handles dying is a lot more along the line of what you would see in a game like Super Meat Boy or Celeste, you know, those kind of fast-paced platformers. What I'm trying to say is, if a game has something in place to punish me for dying, I would much rather it was short-term like this. I really don't feel the need to go all the way back as if I was cold booting the game at the Ubisoft logo at the beginning, unless I felt the need to do that myself. But again, why would I ever choose to do that? I don't have time for this. Anyway, so while I did struggle with this game at times, I did still genuinely want to play through every single level in the game in order to see what kind of madness I missed out on as a kid. So in order to do that here, I went on another nostalgia trip. <laughs> Yep, I dug out a few of those old cheat books I've had lying around here forever because I knew I would finally need them for one of the games on this channel eventually, and I am pretty much done with Rayman's continue system bullshit, so here we are. I genuinely haven't had a look at these things in ages. I I've dug out the PlayStation magazines recently, but not so much the cheat books, and I really do miss these, and cheat codes in general to be honest. A lot more recent games either don't have them, or have you unlock things like costumes and weapons through progression, or even worse, through transactions that you have to spend real life money on. Oh god, no. But yeah, cheat codes were pretty cool. I particularly like the ones that would let you just kind of mess around with the game just for fun. You know, like in Spyro 3, you could change the colour of him or make him completely flat. And let's not forget those classic ones from their Crash and Spyro games that would let you play the demos from the other studio's games. How cool was that? Anyway, as you can probably tell from all of the gameplay shown throughout this video so far, for Rayman, I found this code right here that nets you 99 lives, which I'm pretty sure some Rayman purists out there are going to find that amusing, but I really don't care because it honestly felt fine to me. Without the added unnecessary stress of constantly being booted back to the main menu every 12 seconds, I found myself playing with more confidence, as well as feeling better prepared and more able to embrace the trial and error nature of this game, but, you know, without any of the drawbacks that that would normally have. And yeah, some of the levels were still ridiculously tough, and yes, I still think some of the bosses are way too drawn out and take too long to get started, but I was able to come to that conclusion myself by playing every single level in the game in order right up until you get to this point. And yeah, just to reiterate what I said earlier, you need every single cage in the entire game to even see this final world, let alone see the game's ending, which for me, in my head, would be like not being able to see the normal ending, or even the last few levels of the entire game in the original Crash Bandicoot, if you hadn't already collected every single gem leading up to that point. And yeah, I mean, I'm all for a game having an extra ending, or some kind of bonus reward for putting in the effort of going to 100% completion, but to just have the normal ending locked behind that is absolutely madness. No, I'm not doing that. I'm just going to use this. And yeah, thanks to this game having its save data managed by either the PlayStation memory card or a password screen, you know what I did. Yep, there's a code. You can just type it in and skip to the end of the game. So that's what I'm going to do. And I have to stress, I didn't actually skip to that part of the game because, you know, I did play every single level on the run-up to this point, but when you hit that brick wall, you've got two options, and for me, one of them was not go back and collect every single cage in every single level just for the privilege of being able to play one level at the end of it all. No, that's not going to happen, so yeah, this is how I'm going about doing it, and I am fine with that. I just want to play Rayman 2.
Anyway, so this final world has an alright theme, I guess, but it really is just the one level split into several scenes, so yeah, I'm already kinda glad I didn't actually go out of my way to unlock this one properly. But yeah, everything is made of candy and chocolate, and there's a whole bunch of clowns here attacking you for some reason. Easily the most interesting part of this, though, is when Mr. Dark appears and creates an evil doppelganger of Rayman, mimicking every move that you make as the real one. If the evil Rayman touches the good Rayman, even once, then you die, but it feels like a great and genuinely unique challenge throughout the entire game. You've basically got to make sure you don't stay still for too long, or overlap your movements too quickly, or you're done for. There's also this segment where Mr. Dark flips the left and right controls, which made for an alright one-off thing, but there's also this bit here when he forces Rayman to run, so the entire thing plays out like a modern-day runner game, which is kind of ironic, because Rayman's actually had a couple of those too. And like so many other ideas throughout the game, this infinite runner type gameplay is actually one I wouldn't have minded seeing more of as they could have made some fun levels across the various worlds, but again, it's just this one time. I am, however, pretty glad that the flipped controls were just a one-off though, because I imagine that would have been pretty annoying if it kept showing up throughout the entire game. Anyway, so after this, we gear up for the big fight against Mr. Dark at the end of the game. We start off in his lair, which is actually another genuinely good and unique idea, in that you fight several bosses that are a a combination of the other bosses you went up against earlier on in the game. The background here has all of these stained glass windows with the pictures of those bosses, and they'll glow to show you which ones are being merged together. And I think this is another one of those distinctly Rayman 1 themed things too, because the separated body part design of all of these characters lends itself well to this kind of amalgamated boss fight idea. <laughs> oh, look at this! He's got this silly little mosquito head with a big goofy looking body on it. I don't know what the hell's going on, but this is great. This is what I live for. I would say the entire thing you do here at the end of the game is kind of like a boss rush, but it does kind of defeat the point of it being one of those, because these amalgamated versions of the previous bosses do play out differently to how they did before. But it's not all that bad, as the idea is really cool, it's just there's so many new phases here that you couldn't possibly predict. Once you get through it all though, it does feel pretty damn good. I friggin' punched the air when I got the final one done. Anyway, so after that we get the- You've done it. Wait, what? What, what? what are you talking about? I, I didn't do jack shit, he got away! So yeah, like I said before, I'd never seen a lot of this game prior to this playthrough, but especially not how the game ends, and I was not expecting it to end as suddenly as it did. There you are, just finishing off the fight against Mr. Dark's shape-shifting minion thing, when the ending just starts playing and the credits begin rolling out of nowhere. I have so many questions, like what happened to the Great Protoon, and Batilla the Fairy, because at one point we're shown a scene of her being kidnapped by Mr. Dark, and then nothing. It doesn't get resolved. Resolved. Mr. Dark even flies away before that final fight even begins, so I guess he got away too? <laughs> I've got no idea. The speed at which this game comes to a complete and utter halt is something to behold. I've never seen anything quite like it. It's, it's honestly incredible. The damn thing nearly gave me whiplash. And looking back, yeah, I'll admit that Rayman is probably the most frustrating game I've played through and talked about on this channel in recent memory. I feel like it's a bit too much of a slow start, with most of Rayman's moveset being locked away for far too long, and everything from the midpoint of the game onwards just gets ridiculously difficult and way too much of a hassle in my opinion. And don't even get me started on needing to collect every single cage in order to see the final level, let alone complete the game. However, if you take the necessary steps to loosen some of this game's more unforgiving rules, you know, assuming they annoyed you in the first place like me, then you do end up with a pretty solid 2D platformer, all coated in some of the best sprite work visuals I've ever seen in a game. I mean, look at this, you can't deny the world and the characters of this first Rayman game still look really good, and to top it all off, the PS1 version has such a good soundtrack. I could honestly just gush about that alone all day if I needed to. And yeah, while I did say I was just kind of playing this out of obligation to see where the series began before I move on to the 3D games, I'm glad I did, even if the game did frustrate me towards the end, because there's quite a lot to like about the original Rayman. I just feel like there's too many things here that make the game feel older than it actually is for my liking, you know, I've said enough about that continue system, but uh, yeah, there are other ways to play the original Rayman these days. And I'm not talking about the Game Boy Advance, although that is an option. 
No, I'm talking about Rayman Redemption. So within the Rayman community, I'm pretty sure this is fairly well known by this point, but yeah, this right here is a fan-made reimagining of the original Rayman game, with a whole bunch of new features and additions that was mostly put together by one guy whose name I've only ever seen written down, so I don't really know how to say it, and it was originally released in 2020. I had heard that this was pretty good, but I wasn't really after playing any Rayman games at the time of its release, but you know, seeing as I've just played through the original version, I figured I may as well sit down and play through a few levels of this one just to see if it's any good and to see what it's all about. And within a few minutes, I decided that I was going to up this to an entire playthrough because it is very good and it pretty much fixes all of the issues I have with the difficulty and the pacing of the original game. And you know, I am aware I could have just done a video about this on its own at some point, but I figured people would probably recommend it to me anyway, so it's going to save those people from wondering what I think about it if I just talk about it now. So, where do I begin? Well, first of all, the obvious changes are that the game is now in widescreen and it runs at 60 frames per second. Yeah, you know, this is pretty standard stuff these days, but it does mean you've got a lot more room to see what's going on in some of those levels where you're jumping over gaps at high speed, but the increased frame rate means you have a little bit more time to actually react to that stuff too. But after that, there's just an entire truck full of other quality of life improvements and gameplay additions. For instance, before you even start, you can select a mode that lets you have infinite lives if you like, which, you know, I went for it. I liked it in Rayman Origins, I liked it in Crash Bandicoot 4, and I like it here. I wouldn't worry too much though, because the game still gets plenty difficult along the way. In fact, I think this is even more difficult than the original game, but you know, I think it's a little bit more fair because I don't have to put up with that continue system bullshit anymore, so it's a win-win. Once you do begin though, right away from the very first level, you have pretty much all of Rayman's moves, including the abilities to run faster and grab onto ledges from the very start start, and in many cases some of these earlier levels have been slightly tweaked to accommodate for that wider moveset you have much earlier on. Things like the floating rings are now activated in an entirely different way. By reaching certain points in the story you'll free them from where they're being kept along with other types of floating objects that you can use like these golden rings that spin Rayman around letting you press the jump button to launch him across the screen. Then you've got these little springy guys that bounce you upwards a little bit and these floating rope things with some of these levels using them in combination with one another or in quick succession. Rayman's helicopter hair glide can now be used for the entire duration of the jump's descent instead of just for a quick second, and it can be toggled on and off as many times as you like within that fall. Yeah, if you've played Rayman 2, that's basically how it works now. The little collectible tings that you find in each level are now a form of currency that span the entire game that you can use to buy things like power-ups in between each level, as well as extra skins for Rayman, like some of the costumes from Rayman 3. Three. Similarly, you can also use these to spend them in a slot machine minigame where you can unlock even more skins as well as magician tokens, which themselves unlock these sort of challenge levels that have a timed objective within them. You've got entirely new worlds themed around things that have appeared in other versions of different Rayman games, and each of these have their own new boss fights and enemies. Oh, and some of those alternate gameplay ideas that I felt were underused in the original game either have way more screen time now or get fleshed out into something entirely different. The biggest example for me is going to be the plant growing mechanic because yeah, I really liked this idea and in Rayman Redemption it gets used a few more times throughout the different worlds of the game resulting in some faster paced versions of that original idea which is exactly what I wanted. And you've also got this, the flying level with Bazit the Mosquito from the original game which has been completely redone, now acting more like a shoot 'em up and these appear at multiple points throughout the map as an optional extra level. Now, some of the best things about Rayman Redemption have to do with how it all ends. Now, I'm not going to explicitly show you any of that as it is entirely different, but the fact you don't actually have to go and collect every single cage in the entire game in order to see that is a very welcome change. And the thing is, doing that alone would have crossed my little problem off the list, but no, the cages do actually serve a purpose outside of simply collecting them now. Each time you reach a certain threshold of cages throughout the game, 
him, you can go back to Batilla the Fairy, who will give Rayman a permanent health point boost. This was an absolute game changer towards the end, and I love that there's now two layers of improvement to that entire cage collecting thing that the original game had. And lastly, there is an actual ending. You do still have that sort of boss rush against the amalgamated forms of all of the previous bosses, including some of the new ones now, but after that, the game doesn't just suddenly end. You do get that proper fight against Mr. Dark, and it just keeps on going with an entire new area and an even better fight against him at the very end. I really don't want to show you any footage of that though, but it is so good, and it's exactly what I felt the original game was missing. So, yeah, I mean, this is absolutely fantastic. If you've not played the original Rayman in years, or you just straight up have never played it, then I would be tempted to just say, play this instead, to be honest. You're not only getting everything the original game offered, but you're also getting a lot of new stuff, and a whole bunch of improvements to the stuff that was already there, so it's a win-win. And of course, because this is completely free, it means you've literally got nothing to lose here. It's almost like committing an act of robbery, you know, getting something this high quality for absolutely nothing, but such is the way of the fan game. As for me, well, you know, I do like my 3D platformers, and that is where Rayman did head next, outside of some educational games that I have no interest in talking about right now, but... Yeah, so while I am reluctant to say exactly when, I do want to keep up with this Rayman series of videos, and the next one would hopefully be about the many, many, many versions of Rayman 2 that I have here. So, yeah, hopefully I'll see you guys then.